Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have Kyle DeVries here. And Kyle, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I am a financial planner by trade. I went to UCLA and graduated with an economics degree. So I've kept that economic interest during my life, even though I ended up liking history better. So what I'd like is kind of share some of my thoughts on the climate change as it relates to economics and those types of things. My book name is Burn Baby Burn, Why Bernie Sanders' Policies Would Incinerate the U.S. Economy. One reason I wrote this book is because I have an interest in economics, as I said before, and political economy since I was an economics major. I was very worried back in 2016 about the election when I saw how much interest people had in Bernie Sanders, especially the young. And so knowing my kids were going through high school at that time and knowing kind of what they were learning in high school versus what the actual world was, I thought I would try and write something at least for them and hopefully for a lot of other people to get a different perspective on how to look at some of these things. And the ironic thing is, one of the things I tell people all the time, we're living in some of the best times ever, even though we have all these problems going around internationally, domestically, climate change, all these things. You're still living in some of the best times in history because everyone alive today, even our poorest, are living better than 99.9% .9 of the people that ever walked Earth. And I think we lose that perspective every time we start bashing the country or talking about how dire things are. All right. So that's another reason that I wrote the book was trying to give just a little bit different perspective on that. Another reason that I'm talking to you is climate change cannot be separated from the economy. And I say political economy here. Why is that? Well, political economy really involves two things. It involves economics, which really comes down to trade-offs, opportunity costs. So we need to do cost-benefit analysis on anything that we're considering. And also politics. Politics is a huge part of, matter of fact, I would say my own personal feeling, there's more politics involved in climate change than there is actual science in climate change at this point. The theme of my book, if you read it, you'll see is always the seen versus the unseen. And what do I mean by that? Well, there was a great economist back in France in the early 1800s. His name was Frederick Bastia. And he came up with this concept of the seen versus the unseen. And he simply was saying that a bad economist will only look at the scene, what's on the surface, and the immediate impact of a policy or a change in a policy. A good economist will look at the unseen and will try to look at what could be other possibilities or what did we learn in the past when we did the same thing, which people tend not to learn as we're going along now. They keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. We have a word for that, it's called insanity. But in any event, we want to look at the seen and the unseen, and it's not just economics. If we look at climate change, for example, real quick example, we'll talk more about this in a few minutes. But when you look at renewables like windmills and solar farms, you will see that on the surface, yes, everything looks great. These are beautiful. They generate electricity that is going to be stored in these beautiful batteries that they're building, and everything's hunky-dory and great. But the unseen side of that would be things such as, well, what did it take to build those things? Did we have to do mining? That all involves fossil fuels. Manufacturing these things involves fossil fuels. And finally, when they're done with their useful life, they have to be disposed of. You're gonna bury it in the earth. Well, we have leaching of these minerals and chemicals and so on that go on. Those are all the unseen costs of the renewables. So that theme goes through the book all the time. I illustrate this for my clients when I'm talking about a complex idea for them, especially estate planning, because bottom line is a lot of the estate planning that we do for our clients, they will see that they need to use some sophisticated techniques to really lower that estate tax, but they don't understand those techniques. And we tell them, you don't need to understand it. You just need to understand enough about it. And this is the example I use. You can see here, we have someone using a washboard to wash clothes. Very simple. You need a tub of water, some soap, the washboard, and a lot of elbow grease, and you get the job done. And over here, we have the modern washing machine. And this is much more complicated than the washboard. It's got cir electronic circuitry. It's got plumbing. It's got a lot of moving parts. It's got computer chips and all these buttons. But 
All we have to do is put our clothes inside it, put some laundry detergent in there and hit the start button. And then it's done for us. Not so much elbow grease. Which one would you rather use? Obviously the washing machine. And I equate that to the seen versus the unseen. The seen is simple. The unseen gets more complex, but usually gets us to a better outcome. Now, I also write many stories in my book and they're fictional stories. I like to think they're funny and they're entertaining. I hope that those that read it might see that as well. One of the things I put in here is a short history of civilization and how we got to where we were. And I think it's important that everyone understands this because again, what I see this current generation doing is taking everything they have for granted and just not really realizing how we got it, how we can preserve it. And when you do that, you have a good chance of losing it. So let's take a look at how we got here. Bottom line, if you study history or even if you watch television shows on Netflix or Prime, some series like the Vikings or the Tudors, you'll notice any time in history, the same human story is unfolding because human ha humans haven't changed that much. And you'll see in this instance, and Basia again was one who brought this to my attention. Most humans are motivated by seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And they do that 24 seven. We call that self-interest. Now that's not being selfish. Let me just quantify that right now. Being selfish is acting in self-interest at the expense of someone else. So if I'm hungry and I want to go make a sandwich and eat it, I'm not taking from anyone when I do that. That's not being selfish, that's being self-interested. But if I take someone else's sandwich without their permission, that's being selfish. Okay, so a big difference. But so it's not a bad thing to be self-interested. We just have to recognize that people are self-interested and they're going to act out of their self-interest all the time. We're also social animals. We needed protection in, in numbers and so on and so forth. We won't get into a lot of detail there. I just want everyone to understand trade developed naturally because it made things easier. It lessened our pain of work. And specialization did that even further because it allowed us to be really good at something. And what we weren't good at, we could trade with others to get it. And that's kind of how we got into this wealthy world that we live in now. There's two ways to get wealth. You can either create it or plunder it. And throughout history, you'll see that most wars were fought because one country was plundering another country. And you had a till of the Hun, you had the French revolutions, you've had Russia invading Ukraine recently. And then we've got our modern day that I'm going to talk about in a second. Government, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you feel, they, de they develop naturally as well, or it developed naturally as well. Why? Because, and there's a great book, by the way, that is very short read. You can get it online for free. It's called The Law by Basia. And I would recommend everyone read it because it tells you what the original reason of government was and how far away we've gone from that. And again, he wrote this back in the 1830s or whatever. So things have not changed much. But the idea was one of our natural rights is to protect our own life. And if we can protect our own life, then collectively we can protect all of our lives. And that's where we formed government. And government originally, the purpose of government was to protect our nation or our little settlement or whatever it happened to be. And what we do when we have government, those who give certain people power. And the problem with that is those people are self-interested and they will abuse that power. And this famous quote at the very bottom here in red, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely, is from John Locke back in the 1700s. Again, people haven't changed much at all. So how is plunder existing in modern societies? It's usually a small group of elites, intellectuals, and politicians that want to control and plunder the masses. Terry Gannon, you had on you know, a few weeks ago, I think, he had a great quote in there. He said, if you control the dollars, you control the economy, you control the United States, you control the world. And I believe he's right. I am cynical about a lot of things out there when it comes to politics. I don't like politicians very much. I also don't like groups like the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and the Great Reset that's going on. And I think that you'll see the Great Reset, they're kind of showing it out there. You can get on their website, you can see their videos. They're telling you exactly how they want to control you and basically how to plunder you. They're just not saying that they're going to plunder you. And this is the situation where, you, and what they are using, they're using the climate change narrative. This is the big one that they're gonna try to control you on. We're gonna see how they do that here in a few minutes. Now, the other thing I've noticed is that 
this has become, as I said before, much further from science than it is politics or even religion. And when you look at, I found this slide online. When you look on the left here, you'll see in the yellow area where science is. You see, I've circled this falsification is the norm, open knowledge. The whole idea behind science, as you know, and you've had this with plenty of your guests on in the past, and a lot of the tweets that you send out and so on and when I followed you, is science is about someone making a hypothesis or a theory, and then we try to falsify that theory. It's the whole idea. It's a good process. We want to try and falsify it. Yet what we have going with the climate change thing is more of the religion. And you can see in this circle here, it is closed knowledge, not open to challenge. They have said that, hey, this is the way it is, and either you're on board or you're a granny killer or something like that, or a kid killer. Do some parts of climate change sound more like a religion than a science? I'd say a lot. We've all heard these quotes before, right? The science is settled regarding climate change. Well, there's no such thing as the science being settled, and I'll prove that a little bit later with an alternative theory that's come up. 97% of scientists believe climate change is human-induced. Okay, no, 97% of clients of scientists don't believe on anything together. There's a lot less than that that can form a consensus. Again, why? Because the left side of that chart I just showed you, it's about challenging the existing science and finding new knowledge, new truths. If you don't believe in climate change, you don't care about the future of our children or grandchildren. I think that one's hilarious because the people that say this are the same people that are bankrupting our country and are gonna have our children basically living in poverty or under the great reset where I promise you, the only ones that are gonna be living well under the great reset are the guys like Klaus Schwab, and the elites that want this to happen. Everyone else is gonna pretty much live in poverty, kind of like socialist countries are already, true socialist countries, okay? And my favorite so far, I forget this woman's name, she's a representative of the UN, and she actually said, we own the science of climate change. And I could not believe that when I heard it. That is so arrogant, and it is completely anti-science to say something like that. But here's where we are. And that's why I say, hey, this is a lot more like a religion than it is science at this point. So what are some of the tactics of the climate change religion? And not all of these apply to religions. And by the way, I'm not against religion. I'm a spiritual person. I'm just not any particular religion out there, but they use fear and guilt. They've used that in religion before. If you picked a religion, they've used it. Here in the climate change religion, you've seen all these. World's gonna end in 12 years. You're responsible for weather-related disasters. You're responsible for food shortages. And they use models to support this fear and guilt. Those models will tell you, hey, there's gonna be X degrees increase in Y years if we don't change things. And we get to that tipping point, life is over on earth. There's gonna be more cyclone activity and intensity of that. There's going to be rising sea levels. We'll talk about those in the future and how off those models have been. The solutions, I put that in quotes because are they solutions? They're only solutions if they actually solve something. So what is their solution? Well, they're going to stifle fossil fuel production and they're going to move it to renewables. And we, it's impossible, as you know right now, to move completely to renewables and power our electric grid that and everything else that we need energy-wise. So that's not going to happen soon. And lockdowns, they're coming. And one of the things that they've been talking about at the Great Reset is to have these 15-minute cities. And those 15-minute cities are all designed where you can walk anywhere you need to get within 15 minutes. You'll never need a car. You won't even need a bike. You'll be able to get where you need to get. That's just one example of trying to control you and lock you down and remove your freedom. And that trip you wanted to do Europe, it may not happen for you if they get their way. The solutions results. And in here I put in, in the parentheses, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It works in economics that way. It can work in the climate change religion that way as well. Civil rights violation. We just talked about travel restrictions. They want us to eat crickets instead of meat and they wanna limit your energy use. I think, what is it, France just said that you can't have the hotels any less than 80 degrees during the summer. You know, that's just, that's gonna to move to your house real quickly. Economic devastation, I call it malinvestment. There's a certain school of economics called the Austrian school. They talk about malinvestment as something to do with the central banks and so on and controlling interest rates. I'm really talking about the opportunity costs. 
whatever we decide to shift into climate change, what was the opportunity cost? What could we have done with those monies instead to either help people on earth today or to actually get richer, which in my opinion is what's going to help all of humanity in the future and is gonna limit the climate change problems if we do have them. Inflation is a natural result of this. We've seen it over the past two years. Inflation is rampant. Now, why is it there? You got a lot of people out there with different theories, but I can promise you the one main reason it is we've had all this inflation, we've had too much new money generated into the system, too much money printing going on. So as an example, we had a money supply as was measured by M2 back in 1971, when we went off the gold standard, it was less than a trillion dollars. It took till 2019 to get to 15 trillion. So almost 50 years to go $14 trillion. And yet the next 18 months, we went up to 21 trillion. We increased $6 trillion. Is there any wonder that we have the inflation that we do because of that? And finally, you have this environmental devastation. You have extensive mining we talked about, the machinery that's used and the disposal all those types of things come into play. They also block alternative solutions. They're going to cancel or vilify people like you, which I think you've already have been by Twitter, and all those scientists out there that don't agree with the narrative and yet have some very good things to say that we should be listening to. Also, no nuclear energy. And I'm so surprised at that because I understand on the one hand, they're worried about nuclear reactors blowing up and spewing spent fuel everywhere and creating a dead zone. But that's never really happened except in Chernobyl. And it didn't happen during the tsunami in, in Japan. I think it's relatively, it's a very safe source and there's no emissions. I just don't understand why that's off the table. They pay influencers on social media, celebrities in the press. You've got, always got to watch when you follow the money, where it's going. And if it looks like someone has incentive to say something, you bet that's why they're saying it. There's a lot of hypocrisy out there. As you know, we've got celebrities and politicians purchasing home at sea level, taking private jets everywhere. AOC, one of my favorites, she came out with what I call the Green with Envy New Deal. That's in my book. And you'll see why I call it the Green with Envy New Deal in a few minutes. But when she unveiled that a few years ago, she was caught the next day, I think, flying in from New York to, to Washington, D.C. And every, the press was saying, why'd you fly? And she said, oh, well, it's, I'm saving my constituents two hours of time. There, you know, I mean, if it's, we're going to burn up in 12 years, I don't think that's a good enough excuse. So, and then finally, you got figures lie and liars figure. These are all chapters from my book. The hockey stick, we know that's been debunked now. The cyclone activity, we were supposed to have a lot more hurricanes and tornadoes and a lot higher intensity on that. We haven't seen that. The polar bear numbers have actually gone up instead of down. The Great Barrier Reef is regaining coral as we speak. In your book, do yeah. you break down that $2 trillion? I'm very interested in that. $2 trillion per yeah, year? I, yeah. I, well, I say, it's, I say it's $2 trillion per year because when I wrote the book, it was $1.6 trillion per year and growing. I don't have the actual specific breakdown of that. And by the way, I don't know that you could even really realistically find the actual number because there, it's just all over the map. There's just so many different ways that it comes into play. Even this new deal that they just put together, the new bill for the $1.7 trillion funding bill they just passed, that you know allocates some to out of that $1.7 trillion, but really not a lot when you think about it, toward climate change. So there's that, there's all the spending on the windmills and the solar panels and the installation of that, and, and you go right down the line. So I think it's a huge... It's a huge industry. I could be off. It might be four trillion. It might be one trillion right now, but it's huge. It's a big business. So whatever the number is, it's a lot more than they're paying us skeptics, I bet. A lot more yeah. than that. And again, keep in mind that the people that are normally against big business, the left, they love this big business for some reason. Yeah. So now what are the issues here in green energy? All right. Are there any issues and inconsistencies with the climate change theory? Are alternative solutions, i.e. renewables, practical? And if so, relative to what? The cost per benefits, I'm really going to get into that here in a second, the actual costs as far as the federal costs are concerned. And can we even afford it? And then there's the environmental impact we talked about. Do climate change advocates and activists, do they have motivations other than really helping the environment? I think the answer is most assuredly yes on that. And are there alternative theories to the climate change narrative? 
So let's look at the unseen issues real quickly to green energy. Your cell phone, laptop, electric vehicle, all of these need cobalt, lithium, so on for the batteries. How are these minerals obtained? Cobalt, as an example, and you've had this with one of your guests on the show. It's done primarily in the Congo and children are working the mines are getting less than $2 a day. Is that something the guys that are buying the Teslas really want to support? I don't think so, but this is unseen. They don't necessarily see this. The press doesn't let us know about it. And certainly the politicians don't let us know about it. Mining equipment, we talked about this. It uses lots of fuel to make them and to use them. Now, right here, you can see a picture of a CAT 797. Now, this is used in mines all over the world. And it uses about 1,800 gallons of fuel a day. This is not something you can plug the electric plug into and charge it up over eight hours and then it works for you. you Got to use fossil fuels. The raw materials used to build this, the manufacturing of the cat, the transporting it once it's assembled to these mining sites. Imagine how these things weigh 80, 90,000 pounds a piece without the payload in them. I mean, it's pretty, it's, they're pretty heavy to get around. So all this requires fossil fuels. And this is the biggest thing to me, that payload that you see in this one, and look how big it is relative to a truck and these guys standing on it. That humongous amount of dirt has minerals in it and so on that is enough for just one electric vehicle battery. That's it. We have billions of cars out there on earth. If they're going to replace all of them with electric vehicles, you would need billion or at least a billion of these. I don't see that happening very anytime soon. Same thing applies to solar panels and windmills. Again, we must look at the unseen impacts here, not just the direct costs. And the disposal of these leads to environmental. What are the trade-offs? Remember I said at the beginning, economics involves trade-offs. We live in a scarce world. We only have so many resources. So everything we use to make cell phones, as an example, is something that we can't use to make something else. And in this case, here's some of the trade-offs. We could take a lot of the money that's being used right now to try and solve a problem that we may not really have, this climate change problem, may not be that big. We could use it to help people here and now. Two billion people need clean drinking water. There's still plenty of people that are subject to horrors of malaria every year. And tens of millions are starving now across the world, especially after the pandemic that we just had. So again, some trade-offs, some other unseen costs of not taking care of those problems if we only focus on climate change. Before we get into these numbers, I think it's very important for people to understand how incomprehensible trillions of dollars are. We see it bandied about all the time now. Yo, it's, this last bill, as I said, was $1.7 trillion. But what does that really mean? So in the book, I go through a couple of examples. And let's just say you're lucky enough to be able to spend $1 every second for the rest of your life. How many dollars could you spend a day? Well, there's 86,000 seconds a day. You'd spend $86,000. At that rate, it would take you almost 32,000 years to spend $1 trillion. It's a humongous number. Same thing here. We stack the $100 bills, $100, but not one, $100 bills on top of each other. They, a trillion of those would stack up to 631 miles. That's two and a half times as high as the space station. And this is the best one, I think. One million seconds ago, you were 11 and a half days younger. One billion seconds ago, you may not even have been born. One of your listeners here might be under 31 years old. That's how many years ago it was. And one trillion seconds, this is so hard to believe, it was back in 30,000 BC. Okay, so it's just a humongous number. Again, I, words are one thing, but if you have the visual, it's even better. This is a $100 bill. If we put 100 of them in a stack, then that is a typical what the banks use. They bind this little thing up, and that's $10,000 worth of money. Right here on this next slide, you can see this man standing there next to this little pile. That's a million-dollar pile of $100 bills. He could put that in a grocery bag and walk around with it. If we get to $100 million, it would fit easily on this pallet, this standard pallet. Now we go to a billion dollars. Now you need 10 pallets. Now you're starting to get real serious with the money, right? But this is the one that's crazy. If we want to get to a trillion dollars, that, that man, same size as he was before, he just looks very small because those are not only rows and rows and rows, they're double stacked of pallets. Okay, so this trillion dollars is huge. We have to understand that. We cannot afford 
climate change solutions. And let's just look at our federal budget from last year. This is from the Office of Management and Budget. I'll have a slide on the next page to show out a projection, but this was the actual numbers from last year. Discretionary expenditures were 1.7 trillion. That's defense is about half of that. Non-discretionary expenditures are things like Medicare, Medi Medicaid, Social Security, and so on. That totaled 4 trillion last year. The interest on our federal debt, which is now at $31 trillion, was 300 billion, and that's expected. Just the interest alone is expected to rise over $1 trillion as we get more to market rates of interest coming here. That is alone, that's a trillion dollars. You can't go to anything else because we have to service our debt. If we don't service our debt, people will not lend us money anymore. And if they don't do that, you'll start to see the collapse of the dollar like you've never seen. So this is very important for the government to keep the integrity of the money going. They're gonna to have to pay that interest, even if it goes up. So a total of $6 trillion and going up. So the trade-offs here are huge. If you were in charge of this and you really wanted to allocate trillions of dollars to climate change, we have a limit on how much we can get from people tax-wise, receipts for government. What are you gonna take out? Social security? They're already set to run out of reserves before 2035. And I want people to understand, I don't want them to get scared on that. The, the, that doesn't mean it goes bankrupt. It simply means that they'd have no other IOUs to draw down on. So once they hit that, whatever that target point is, it looks like they'd have to reduce existing benefits to 70 or 80% of what they currently are. So no one would lose social security, but you would get a haircut unless they do something else. Same thing for Medicare. You're going to get rid of that? I don't think so. So we're not getting rid of those two things, defense, infrastructure, homeland, you name it. What are we going to get rid of? It's a very tough decision. And again, is it going to something that is really going to help us in the future? Or is this just, we're hoping it's going to help us in the future. It may not even be a real problem. So here's the page from their buzzer report from last year. You'll notice the first three years here, 2020 through 2022, these were actual numbers. And there's the numbers I just showed you, the 4 trillion of receipts, the 6 trillion of expenditures. I've highlighted the expenditure thing here. What's interesting, if you go down to the bottom, the total outlays in 2010, when Obama was in office, were three and a half trillion dollars, okay? They moved to, in 2019, they moved up $1 trillion to $4.4 trillion. Now, that was a nine year period. Look what happened in 2020. It went up 50%, the spending, up over $2 trillion in that one year. Now, again, that COVID came, they, had, they did the stimulus and all that other stuff. But here's the ratchet effect. Went up again, went down last year, which was a good thing. But look at the rest of the budget going forward. It just keeps going up. And just know that these numbers here for the receipts are based on an economy that's going to grow at on the base, I implied that from these numbers down here, that's going to grow at an average of 3%. Well, our economy over long periods of time usually grows around 2%. So these numbers may be way off as far as the deficits are concerned. Now you come down here, one last thing, and you see receipts as a percentage of GDP. And notice that it's always around 17, 18, 19%. Throughout history, we've had a tax law, the highest marginal tax bracket, has been anywhere as high as 92% and down to as low as 24%. In all those years, the total receipts as a percentage of GDP were anywhere from 15 to 20%, usually averaging around 17.5%. Look at that. We're not changing a darn thing here. So we're going to need a lot more money for the climate change stuff. In I mean, trillions of dollars, you're not going to get it from taxes. It's just not going to happen. So we're in trouble. Again, you have here, it, it's so hard to comprehend. I wanted to say, what if a family of four lived like the federal government did? All we have to do is take eight zeros off of those numbers. So if I go back up to here, you'll notice in 2023, they're projecting we'll have 4.6 trillion in revenues. And then the government will spend 6 trillion for a shortfall of 1.3 trillion. If we take eight zeros off, you will get to an income for a family of four of 46,410, outlays of $60,000, a deficit, a shortfall of almost 14,000. How's this family gonna afford it? They have no savings, so they got added to their credit cards. The problem is their credit cards are already 
at a balance of $309,000. Now, what would credit card companies allow this family to get away with that? No, they would have capped them at fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a long time ago of debt. Instead, our, go our government is the credit card company. They're the ones spending the money, but they are the credit card company too. We are set on a course here to really hurt our country financially, especially when it comes to our money. And our money, as we know, has already lost a lot of value over the last two years from inflation. If we hit hyperinflation, it's going to be like Venezuela. And honest, people can't believe that would happen here. It can happen anywhere if you don't manage the, the money properly. So getting back to climate change now and how this impacts it, we want to make sure that we're fiscally responsible on this. And as I said, there's no way to allocate all the money that we need. So I think it's a pipe dream to assume that we can have an all electric or all renewable electric grid here anytime soon in the future. Just a pipe dream. Now, what's the other part to this? Well, I said that does anyone have any other all you know objectives? to their climate change agenda other than just really helping the climate? And the answer is most assuredly yes. Here is AOC's chief of staff when she unveiled the great green with envy new deal, as I call it. He said to someone, a reporter asked, and said, do you guys think of it as a climate thing? Because we really think of it as a, how do you change the entire economy thing? Meaning we want to go socialist or like what the great reset's doing. This is the Great Reset's famous thing. The year is 2030. You will own nothing and be happy. They're telling us, right? Loud and clear for us to hear. They want you to eat bugs. They don't want you to move around very much. And you've shown, since I've been following you, lots of tweets that environmental concerns are a distant second to really eliminating capitalism. They hate capitalism and adopting some kind of form of socialism. And to me, being the cynical person that I am, that's really what I see is the whole objective here. If you look at any socialist country, they're some of the worst polluters, true socialist countries now I'm saying, like Venezuela, they're some of the worst polluters in the world, okay? China and India account for a lot more emissions than we have over the last 10 years. And they are not necessarily capitalist countries, right? Climate change predictions have been famously wrong. Florida should have been underwater by now. There's been no change since Al Gore's movie. The Great Barrier Reef was supposed to die off, 30% increase in the last year. Glaciers melting. Greenland, as I understand it, just increased its ice mass over the summer, which I thought was amazing. You know, it was snowing there in the summer in Greenland and it increased its ice mass. All these things are blamed on, on greenhouse gases. And then the question is, could there be any other thing? And you've had plenty of people on, experts in physics and in climatology and so on, that have come on and say, yes, there's other reasons for the going on. One of the guys that I follow out there who's been fantastic, especially over the last two years with COVID and everything, but also opines on some other things like climate change, is the ethical skeptic. I recommend not only people follow you, they should follow the ethical skeptic. One of his theories is this exothermic core cycle theory, and I'm not going to go into it. I don't understand it nearly as well as he does. If you're interested, you should get on his website at theethicalskeptic.com and search for the exothermic core cycle theory, and it will explain to you how, based on the axis of the earth and how the earth spins and sometimes it spins faster and then slower and that all depends on the magma underneath and so on the fluid dynamics will also have an impact on the ocean temperature because it depends on what's coming and the heat that's being released from the mantle from the core into the oceans and that he says explains the oceans increasing in temperature not climate change so it could have we could be totally wrong on this. And that's one of the themes in my book also. And one of the things I say quite specifically is there are, there's no way they know everything yet. They've only been studying climate for at best. I mean, in, it really studying is what, since the fifties maybe. And we would need thousands of years under our belt to really have an idea of what's going on. There's mechanisms on earth they don't understand. And I know that because how many ice ages have we had? And one of the theories we had when I went to UCLA at school was the global cooling theory. And that made a lot of sense at that time too, because what they were saying is as ice gets more and more plentiful in the North, it reflects a lot more light back out into the atmosphere and then out of the atmosphere. And that cools us down even more, which means even more ice. And you get to a point where all land masses are covered by ice. Made sense 
but that happened in the past. How did it then move to where we are now, where we don't have ice everywhere? Something happened. It wasn't human induced because we weren't around long enough. So you have all these questions that come into play. And for me, someone who's very oriented toward the finance side of things, I go, I don't want to ruin people's lives and their standard of living and so on for something that may not be a problem, or even if it is a problem, I think the best way for us to solve it is to get wealthier as a nation and as a world. And that will take care of a lot of problems. Finally, in summary, I would say that fossil fuels are going to be around for a long time. This is a pipe dream that we're going to get rid of it. 80% of the energy worldwide is fossil fuels right now. That's not coming down anytime soon, no matter what they do in Congress. We can't afford to spend $6 trillion per year right now let alone allocate trillions more for climate change. It just isn't going to happen. Socialists, progressives, the WEF, the Great Reset, call them what you want. They want to outlaw capitalism and they're going to, they're using environment. This is their big weapon that they're going to use, that they're drawing out is a way to control us again. A lot of people thought COVID was, I don't know that I would go there. That was a way to control the masses and see how pliable they were to, to authoritarianism and stuff like that. I don't know about that, but I do know that this is what they're trying to do to, and it has nothing to do with saving the environment. Because as I said, these guys, they're going to be eating steak, flying around in their pri private jets, drinking the finest wines around while everyone else is eating crickets and staying at home. And then science is constantly changing discovering new things. We, the big bang theory, even that was supposedly was settled science. Even now I've seen recently where there are scientists out there that they don't believe in that. They think there's another theory and they're developing that. So we don't know everything there is to know. Even Einstein said, the more I know, the more I find out how much I don't know. And that really applies here in the climate change arena and never accept that the science is settled. Always look at the unseen not just the scene. And so with that, I'm done. Excellent. I really enjoyed that. I do have some questions. What do you see happening to the financial markets, et cetera, in the next 10 years? Do you think Armageddon is coming or can we get through this? <laughs> well, okay. one thing that, you know, I have a broker dealer. I work because I'm in the securities industry as well. I can't give any project projections like that. Okay. I'm not allowed to. What I can tell you though, is what I have said is we're on a route here I'm not going to say what you should do with your money. I'm just saying that we are going down a road where it's it, that ratchet effect is taken. You can see in their projections it's taken effect, right? We were at 4 trillion. We shouldn't have been much more than 4 trillion by now if it was a standard growth on expenses. Instead, we jumped up to 6 trillion and they're just going to keep it there and grow it from there. Wait till the next thing comes up and they got to jump it up again and they'll just keep it there. We cannot afford that. It will hurt the currency. It will hurt standards of living. And my biggest fear is all this malinvestment that we're taking monies that and we're plowing a lot into something that's probably not going to do much for any of us when, the, when it all is said and done. And I would rather see us get wealthier to be able to combat these things. Bjorn Lomborg, as an example, and I like him because he does believe in climate change, but he doesn't believe it's, it's, it's a crisis. And he thinks there's a lot more things we can do with the money, like getting people clean water. And he said, he had charts recently where the deaths from climate disasters have gone down 99% since 1909. That's because we're wealthier. That's the main reason. So if we get even wealthier in the future, I think we're going to be able to combat anything that comes our way. What do you think is going to happen with the climate scam agenda in the next 10 years? Do you think people are going to forget that they ever believed in it? Or is it still going to be alive in 10 years? You know, that's a great question. On the one hand, the, I'm a pessimistic that it's still, they've got a foothold in there. And People have been so brainwashed on this, especially students. I know my kids, I know their experience. I tried to counter them. They would get mad at me when I would tell them that, well, you know, you could think a little bit more critically this way and just not, you know, not everything you're taught is true. But a lot of people are that way. I think people are good people at heart. Most people are, but they're also, they're self-interested. You know, if you're not an expert in climate change, and you're not probably going to spend a lot of time researching it, kind of like you and I do. And we're not experts on climate change either, not like these other guys are. But when you do that, when you're self-interested, you're not going to be spending a lot of time on it because you want to spend your time doing other things you enjoy. And so you're just going to take what the media is telling you or what the politicians tell you or what your favorite celebrity is telling you. 
and you're not going to think much about it. So the pessimistic side of me says, well, this could get more, get worse and worse as time goes on. On the other hand, I think what's happened the last two years has put a big dent in science. And I think there's a lot of distrust now in experts, and I think that's a healthy thing. And if we can keep that distrust going and get people more skeptical and really more, and when you see the polls out there, what are people most concerned about right now? It's the inflation and it's their, the economy and their safety. The environment and the climate change is way down at fifth or sixth as far as in it. When I say way down, it's like 2% of the people are concerned with that. Well, 73% are concerned about inflation right now. So, you know, that's a good sign. And I think that skepticism and that doubt now, people are, might just say, you know what? I don't buy this anymore. Let me live my life. Let me pursue my job. Let me do what, what makes me happy and things will work out in the long run. And I believe, as I said earlier, if we get wealthier, there's not a problem. Other than a comet smashing into earth, there's not a problem that we're not gonna be able to take care of. Last question is, uh, from your perspective, is there anything that climate realists should be doing that, that we're not doing enough of to try to win people over? Any ideas there? Uh, that's a really good question. I think having more forums like this and, you know, people are getting the word out there. They're not canceled as much. Like, I think one of the things Elon Musk has done is love him or hate him. He's opened up a Twitter. It's much more open. It still has its issues. But you're starting to see some other sides of the story now, and they're not getting knocked off, and they're not getting those warning labels on there anymore. And hopefully there's going to be some documentaries done out there and some things like, well, I love the movie Dope Sick as an example, because it showed how pharma works. And I think if we could have a movie like that, the opposite of an Al Gore movie that's a documentary that would show what's really going on behind the scenes with the Great Reset, what's really going on behind the scenes with these guys who claim to be environmentalists, but really just want to change the economy. I think if we can get those things out there, I'd love to be a part of that, but I don't know where to start on it. You know, we have to do that. We have to get the message across. So, and, that, and your guess is as good as mine on some. I think what you're doing is good, but we need more exposure. Any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up? Not really. Just that, again, I'm a, you know, I've talked about some pessimistic things. I'm really an optimist, even though I'm a cynic regarding politicians and quote experts out there. I am when it comes, I think most people are good and they will do the right thing in the long run. And I think when it all shakes out, the world's going to end up being a better place and climate change will be looked at a, like a lot of things, like kind of like Y2K. If you remember Y2K, they made a big deal about that. Everyone was buying software to try and correct a problem that never came. They spent billions of dollars as an industry on Y2K, and it was not even a blip when it when that calendar turned January 1st of 2000. My computer worked just fine. I'm sure yours did. Planes didn't fall out of the sky and your car didn't stop in the middle of the freeway, right? But these were all things we were told was going to happen. And I think all these catastrophic stories that we're hearing about climate change, people are going to look back at it in history and go, what were those people thinking back then? And especially with the alternative use of the monies that we should have done to help people that really need the help right now, as opposed to, again, battling something that we don't really know for sure is going to be a problem in the future anyway. All right. Thank you very much. And I will put the Amazon link to your book in the show description so people can get that. So Thank All you. Right. Thanks a lot. And we'll talk Appreciate to you next time. It. All right. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.